Hi everyone, my name is Kaylee Nguyen and I'm a GI nurse practitioner here at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford in Palo Alto, California. It is my pleasure today to review some basics about the specific carbohydrate diet and how we use it in clinical practice. Much of this information is based on our 16 years of experience guiding and supporting our patients with IBD and their families who choose the SED as a mainstay of their therapy. Now, if you're interested in the SED, which is why you're here today, you might've read a little bit about it via this book called Breaking the Vicious Cycle. Um, the SED was derived by Dr. Sidney Haas in the 1950s, initially to treat celiac disease. And in 1960s, Elaine Gottschall, who was then a housewife, met with Dr. Haas, um, desperate to find a um, non-surgical uh, intervention for her daughter who had severe uh, ulcerative colitis. So she used this diet to treat her daughter and she credited it with preventing a colectomy. So really motivated and thrilled by this, she um, was determined to go back to school. She got her doctorate in nutritional biology, or sorry, nutritional biochemistry and cellular biology, and then refined the, the diet to its current form and published it in 1987, some 30 years or 20 to 30 years after her first experience with it. Um, and this book, along with the internet, um, really made the SED accessible to a lot of people all over the world. And it is widely used as a nutritional therapy in IBD these days, amongst many other um, emerging therapies. So Gottschall theorized that um, complex carbohydrates contributes to a vicious cycle in a, a vicious cycle of inflammation, which is depicted here. She proposed that injury to the small intestinal surface in persons with IBD leads to impaired digestion and malabsorption of disaccharides and um, other carbohydrates that get turned into disaccharides in the GI tract, which um, uh, allows the disaccharides to travel whole to the latter part of the intestines where it serves as a food source for the bacteria there. And that leads to bacterial overgrowth. And the byproducts of bacterial overgrowth, including hydrogen, methane, carbon dioxide, um, would then lead to um, bloating, pains, um, and a lot of the clinical symptoms that people with IBD and um, small bowel bacterial overgrowth experience. It also causes an osmotic effect that not only worsens diarrhea, but also leads to additional intestinal injury, and then the cycle repeats. So she thought that maybe one way to break this cycle would be um, to eliminate disaccharides and uh, certain carbohydrates that break down into disaccharides. This then would stop the feeding frenzy by essentially starving the harmful bacteria in the gut and break the cycle and then gradually um, reduce mucosal injury and allow the intestines to heal over time. So in order to do this, one would need to mostly consume, consume simple carbohydrates, which are more readily absorbed proximally in the small intestines and not available for fermentation by bacteria that live in the latter part of the intestines in the colon. So you would cut out most of this and most of this and focus on consuming this. And that would be pretty logical. Um, but I will explain next that the SED is much more complex than this and not always logical because we get a lot of questions on why certain foods can be eaten and why certain foods cannot. So I want to bring your attention to the S in SED, which stands for specific and not simple. So though it, though it is true that nearly all simple carbohydrates are legal on the SED, not all disaccharides or more complex carbohydrates are illegal within the SED. So one example is fructans, which are um, short and long chains of fructose molecules strung together. The shorter chain ones are called FOSs or um, uh, fructooligosaccharides, and the longer chain ones are called inulin, which is considered a fiber. Um, so on the SED, Jicama and flax seeds are not allowed because they have a lot of complex sugars uh, in the form of inulin. And so that makes sense, right? However, uh, asparagus and onions are also really high in inulin, yet it is allowed on the SED. And why that is, I don't know. 
Could we find over years of practice and trial and error that flax seeds and jicama really can be consumed without any um, detriment uh, for people on the diet? Maybe. And so we're kind of experimenting um, over time with that. The second example is galacto-oligosaccharides, which are chains of um, galactose molecules with an end um, glucose. And GOSs um, occur in high amounts in chickpeas and soybeans, and because they're more complex, they're not allowed on the SED. But what doesn't make sense is that lentils and peas also have a lot of GOSs, yet they are allowed. And then um, another example would be polyols, known as um, sorbitol or, or including sorbitol and, man and mannitol. And um, these are sugar alcohols, which are technically not SED legal because they are indigestible um, carbohydrates that could be fermented by gut bacteria and feed gut bacteria. Um, yet avocados and stone fruits, which have a lot of sorbitol are allowed and cauliflower and mushrooms, which have a lot of mannitol are allowed. Um, sorry, legal should have had an L in there. I will give one more example as that sugars in ripe bananas um, and you know bananas with a, a spot of brown on them to signal that they are ripe. Um, even those have fructose and glucose, but 20% of the sugars are still sucrose. So these inconsistencies are what makes the SED confusing at the beginning. And you just have to realize that when you are starting the SED in its strictest form, you're taking advantage of the knowledge acquired from many years of trial and error by others and someone else went through those and took the time to write their experiences down for you. So take the inconsistencies with a grain of salt, just go with it and then we'll add on or liberalize um, when and if the gut settles down. So I will spend some time on this because this is really the gist of the SED. Um, what can you eat on it? First and foremost, like all diets used in the treatment of IBD, the focus is on eating whole foods without additives or preservatives. And though fresh foods are of course preferred, you can have these allowed foods in any uh, form, including frozen, canned, or dried. So um, the first thing that you can have is really all meats, fish, shellfish, and eggs. And you must, of course, avoid foods that are um, processed or meats or um, fish that are uh, marinated with any illegal ingredients or have, um, uh, uh, have preservatives such as potato starch or thickeners such as potato starch um, or sugar or maltodextrin. You are allowed to have most vegetables, including all leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables, such as broccoli and root vegetables, such as beets and carrots. What you can't have are starchy or mucilaginous vegetables, such as um, potatoes, corn, cassava, cactus, okra, or seaweed. And I just like to think about avoiding things that fry up really well, and then avoiding things that get really slimy when cooked. Um, you can have most fruits on the SED. You just have to make sure bananas have greater than one brown spot to indicate that the starches have been converted by the fruit amylase to um, uh, more digestible sugars. Um, uh, what you can't have are green bananas, plantains, whether green or yellow, green coconut, including the um, coconut water that we buy at the store, even if it has nothing added, can't have tamarind because again, it's kind of mucusy um, and, and sticky. And then green jackfruit is not allowed either. You can have all fats and oils, um, including butter and including oils made from things that are not allowed on the SED like corn oil. Corn is not allowed, but the corn oil is because it doesn't contain the, um, the sugars or the starches, only the fat. Um, and of course, like all diets for IBD, um, the SED really tries to limit uh, the use of excess uh, highly processed uh, vegetables such as, um, veg such as canola vegetable or coin oil, as well as fat alternatives such as margarine or soy butter. In terms of dairy, unlike many um, IBD diets, it does allow dairy um, as, as long as the dairy is lactose-free. So this includes lactose-free, milk, if you can find any that doesn't have thickeners. Um, the book actually says that you can consume it six months in, but I've had lots of patients start it earlier and they're fine. Um, 
that it also allows aged cheeses. So all cheeses that are aged for more than 30 days where you turn the label and it says carbohydrate zero, you can have that includes Parmesan, cheddar, brie. Um, and it really focuses on SED yogurt, which is really an important part of the diet, not just in the form of, not just because it has a lot of probiotics, but also because it's an essential um, part of lots of different recipes. It provides lots of calcium and vitamin D, which um, tends to be deficient in people with IBD in general and people on specialized diet um, uh, especially. What you can't have is dairy with lactose or dairy with any added sugars, such as regular cow's milk or goat milk, buttermilk, kefir, which still has a little lactose, um, as well as commercial yogurts, which are not aged long enough to remove the lactose, as well as unaged cheeses, such as um, mozzarella, um, uh, Mexican cheeses, cream cheeses, um, mascarpone. Um, I will also mention that because I don't think I have another time to mention it is that the yogurt, um, the probiotics in the yogurt and other fermented foods is really highly encouraged because we know that fermented foods and eating live culture probiotics can help expand the um, diversity of um, microbiota in your GI tract of good diversity. And it also reduces inflammatory cytokines as compared to um, taking probiotics that are encased in a pill form. Um, the next thing that it's allowed is most nuts and seeds, as well as nut and coconut flowers. Um, and you can't have any nuts that are flavored or coated with sugars or starches. And the three exceptions that you cannot have in terms of seeds is chia, flax, and hemp seeds. And again, I don't know why that is. Um, I've had some patients successfully uh, be able trans to transition onto flax seeds without issue. In terms of legumes, you, um, you can have peanuts, lentils, and many beans. Peanuts don't have to be soaked. It can be roasted and of course pureed into peanut butter form. Lots of peanut butter over the counter, so you don't have to make your own peanut butter, but lentils and there's a list of beans that um, you can have must be soaked and washed really well to get take away some of the phytates and the gas producing um, insoluble fibers. So we get to the crux of um, the diet and its major challenge is that the diet does not include any grains at all. It does not include any gluten-free grains, including soy, rice, quinoa, amaranth, um, uh, tapioca starch, really no starchy things and no grains. Uh, and I think that is the biggest challenge for most families. In terms of sweeteners, um, most of the time you're using honey or dates. The book says that saccharin is allowed, but just because it's an artificial sugar, we really um, discourage the use in, of it, although it is useful in some um, baking applications on the SED, and then almost all the spices are allowed. What is not allowed are any other sweeteners, including cane sugar, palm sugar, coconut and monk fruit sugars, maple and agave syrup. And again, many of these syrups contain mostly fructose. So with time, we uh, tend to add these on. It tends to be tolerated fairly well. And then um, one word about spices is that you get the mixed spices. Many of them have anti-caking agents and added sugar. So um, mixed spices, you have to read very, very carefully to make sure they don't contain illegal ingredients. All right, so I just want to let you know that um, I have a family member who's been on the SED for more than 16 years and is going strong and we never run out of food to eat. Um, and it's I wanna emphasize that creativity plus exploration um, will lead to lots of variety and deliciousness. And there's just endless, endless recipes that we can offer um, and that, you, that can be had uh, via the internet. And we spend a lot of time coaching our families on um, different, um, on, on how to search the internet and how to substitute recipes and stuff. So how do we use the SED? Um, we use it to treat IBD, of course. Um, and over the years, we found that response is often related to IBD type, but not always. So if there's only, if you have IBD that only has small bowel involvement, you will get the most consistent response. Um, or if you have large bowel invo involvement with some small bowel involvement, you have a high chance of response as well. 
We've had variable response with people who have ulcerative colitis and with kids who have ulcerative colitis, even though the diet was initially um, used to treat ulcerative colitis, we um, just haven't had as much success with it, um, though the response has been variable. And those with perianal and fistulizing disease, um, again, we've had variable response typically um, in conjunction with um, uh, biologic therapy. What we have found is that if you have exclusive Crohn's colitis or Crohn's disease affecting only the large intestines, or you have ulcerative proctitis, which is ulcerative colitis affecting only the rectum, then you have the, we found that there's least consistent response. Um, in terms of utilization, we use it in many ways, um, the same way as uh, medications. We use it as induction um, to kickstart a remission as well as maintenance of long-term uh, therapy. Uh, we use it as monotherapy, meaning it's the only therapy um, in people with mild to moderate disease without the addition of medications um, as they transition off of intral nutrition or exclusive formula nutrition or steroids. And we also use it to replace medications due to loss of response or intolerable um, side effects to medications. We use it in combination therapy, meaning diet plus uh, medication therapy in those with moderate to severe disease. And we've really found that there's a great synergistic effect of the diet um, in addition to mesalamines, immunomodulators such as methotrexate or 6-MP and biologics. Um, and it, it, the response is both ways, meaning diet alone doesn't quite work and you add the biologics or the other medication with diet and it works great, or medication alone doesn't work that well and you add the diet and it really makes it uh, work much better. In terms of limit, we have no age limit. Our youngest patient who started the diet uh, was at age two and he's still going strong at age six. And so you, we have to figure out um, if the SCD is right for you um, and how do we figure that out? So first, of course, we talk about what kind of IBD you have. Um, uh, often I say, no matter what type of IBD you have, if it's not that severe and you have about two months to, um, to be safe trying the diet and there's another therapy in place to assure you're safely healing, then it's absolutely okay to try the diet and see how you respond. Um, we talk, we discuss how severely ill you are. Um, if you have so much pain at diagnosis that you cannot eat or, um, uh, or you have severe growth failure or bloody diarrhea, then you might need a supplemental induction therapy such as steroids or a biologic therapy or um, EEN to the point where you feel well enough to be able to uh, eat regular foods. Um, we also uh, always ask whether or not you have strictures and depending how on how severe the stricture is or if it's a fixed stricture or an inflammatory stricture, we would need to be careful about starting you on a version of the SED um, that might be more easy to digest or a low fiber version of it. Um, and then we also assess how open you are to eating a variety of foods. We have some patients who come to us with eating only five foods and it takes us six months to kind of like transition their diet to a point where they can actually um, revert, actually transition onto the SED safely. And so we try to work on diversifying the diet first. And then when, when we reach a point where there's enough diversity to where we know that, that they're safe, um, then we um, really start the SED as a therapy. And it takes us a little bit of time to transition, usually two weeks up to six months in some cases. And during that time that they're waiting, they're on a different therapy. Um, we also assess really how much time does the family have and um, are there resources to provide a variety of foods at home. We had a few college students who are living on their own who have really limited income and no matter um, how much they really want to do the diet, it's just not safe um, and not sustainable long term. So we try to um, help out and encourage other therapies. I also have certain families who have very young children, four or five in the household, two full-time working parents, and some Sometimes that's just too difficult to really be successful on the SED. So we have to be really cognizant about that. Um, and then I ask, can you commit two months? Because it takes that long to see first of you respond, um, then for you to heal and then reach the a point of expanding your diet. Um, 
And so then I say two months, and then can you do another 10 months after that if you do respond after two months? And then lastly, do you have multiple food allergies or severe restrictions such as like being a vegan, for example. So if you have a few allergies or restrictions, we can definitely work with that. But if there are many, many allergies and you have to restrict multiple food groups, then, um, then it becomes too narrow and it would make it really difficult to meet dietary needs on nutrition alone. Um, so things to consider is, uh, will the whole family eat SED at home? Every situation is different, but how will this impact the cook or the child on the SED? A lot of it depends on the um, child's age and maturity. Um, we have uh, we work on meal plans that will accommodate various diets seamlessly, like taco night or meat and veggies with two types of pasta, etc. We also talk about school accommodations for the younger kids. We make sure the teacher knows and the parents might prepare a box of SED legal treats um, or ask to be notified ahead of time when there's a birthday party so that you can bring SED legal treats. For older kids, you might ask for access to a microwave or a refrigerator to store essentials like salad dressings or dips or sauces or cold meats to add to salads at school. Um, and then we also talk about concurrent therapy and interpreting response. So this is a really important question because sometimes when you start out with more than one therapy, so for example, you're starting a biologic and the SCD at the same time, it is impossible to know exactly which therapy worked. So sometimes you just have to go on faith and give it some time because the answer will come over time. And um, as long as your child or the patient gets into remission and does really well, then over time, we can discuss withdrawal of one therapy over another. Um, it is very, very important to discuss a plan B with your provider, because like I said, not everyone responds to the diet, um, reasons of which are very, very complex and not well understood. Um, but it is very important to know that the diet can work it can work to some degree, but it doesn't always work and you need a plan B to make sure that your child is safe and will have the opportunity to heal. I also caution families about combining diets. It gets very, very confusing. Um, families try to combine more than one diet, for example, um, trying to do the SED plus uh, the paleo and the SED allows for peanuts and lentils, um, but some families, don't allow peanuts and lentils because the paleo diet, which they're also trying to follow, say these foods are pro-inflammatory. This gets really um, confusing and imposes uh, often unnecessary restrictions that can hinder success um, in the long run. So if you choose the SED, really stick to the concepts of the FCD and give it some time and don't try to con combine diets. And lastly, dietary therapy, I want to emphasize, does not preclude surveillance care of IBD. Some people think that just because you're not on medications to treat IBD, that they no longer need to follow up with an IBD specialist. And this is simply not true because IBD is a chronic condition and you will need ongoing care no matter what therapy you're on. It is important despite how well you respond to nutritional therapy and that um, and you should follow up because your growth and nutrition needs to be monitored, you need to be updated on research and recommendations, get up to date on vaccines and vaccine recommendations, as well as monitor for extra intestinal symptoms and complications and um, making sure you're seeing subspecialty cares like optometry, um, but most importantly for disease surveillance um, and making sure that you get the right um, uh, blood draws and stool studies and endoscopies and MRIs to make sure that the diet is indeed working more than just controlling clinical symptoms, working, working to, to heal IBD rather than, um, than just eliminating clinical symptoms. So um, we get asked a lot about stages and modifications um, and when we use them. So can you start with a modified version of the SED? And there is good evidence um, that the modified version of the SED, uh, which we derived for a study called PRODUCE, um, which includes uh, the SED, but includes rice, sweet potatoes, oatmeal, maple syrup, and cacao, it might be just as effective in managing IBD as the stricter version or the original version of the SED, but the verdict is still out. 
For now, uh, when we recommend SED, we still stick to the strict version for the first one to three months until we can determine response. And then we modify when absolutely needed to keep the child on board and, and going. People ask, when do we use staging? Um, and we usually do not recommend staging unless the child has known sensitivities to certain foods um, or he or she has active symptoms such as diarrhea or abdominal pains, or there's an inflammatory stricture that might cause an obstruction if you go directly to a full fiber diet. Um, but if, if the family is, if the child is doing fine, not specifically majorly symptomatic, then we usually just start with the full SED. Um, and if we run into problems, hit a wall, then we go back and like we might recommend dairy-free SED for a couple of weeks or, um, or a you know, tomato-free SED for a few weeks, depending on what uh, walls we hit. One word of caution when you're using staging is do not get stuck on one stage. If you need to start with stages, and then it's really important to diligently push forward and move past the stages onto the full version of the SED within several weeks. This is not just for variety, um, but also to assure nutritional adequacy and maintain the mental fortitude you need to um, continue with the diet if you do well. Um, we typically advise two ways to approach uh, staging, depending on the patient's comfort level. We recommend two to five days at any one stage, and we use the stages in pecanbread.com or nimble.org um, under the produce materials. Sometimes we do start, we do start by recommending a dairy tree trial, trial um, for a while if there's some incomplete responses or we know that there's some dairy sensitivity, which is not uncommon. And um, we have a lot of vegetarians on the SED, but we do discourage people who are vegans or who have other very special dietary needs to do the SED. Um, I want to emphasize that the SED, um, that on the SED, there is a steep, steep learning curve during the first several months. But if you respond with it and stick with it, it will get easier and it will become second nature and you will become an expert eventually. Just be patient, allow yourself to be human and really just enjoy the ride. Um, I also want to say that depending on where, what, um, what, uh, area of the country or medical center you're from, your IBD provider may not be an expert on any of the nutritional therapies, especially the SED. But as long as, long as your provider is supportive, you have an endless resource, an endless list of resources to tap into online and in your local community. I've listed some reliable um, websites here. You can also ask your providers to help connect you with other patient families who are going through similar journeys Journeys, as well as join the SED Families Facebook group and follow folks on Instagram um, and different blogs. Um, yeah, so that's what I'll say about that. So we'll move on to potential hiccups on the SED. Um, Feeling off while adjusting to a diet is an actually a pretty normal response. Some people attribute it to a bacterial die off as your microbiome changes. Some call it a response to cutting out sugar. We don't know for certain what causes it, but it's real and it's okay and it'll pass in a couple of weeks. Um, also, people who start the SED tend to have an insatiable hunger, and you might find um, yourself incapable of feeling full and no matter how much you eat and how much, how large your servings are at the beginning. This is likely a function of restricting starches, which contribute to um, prolonged satiety. Um, you might feel low energy, so make sure you're getting enough calories, of course, but also um, making sure that um, you're eating um, carbohydrates along with some fat. So for example, if you're gonna eat an apple or celery, um, please have it with nuts or a nut butter. Um, you'll learn to, this is very important, a digestive versus an inflammatory uh, response. I spend a lot of time talking to my patients about this and you'll learn to recognize these uh, subtle differences over time. A digestive response does not mean the diet is failing. So for example, you feel bloated after eating a bunch of French onion soup or four artichokes in a row. This does not mean the diet is failing. These symptoms usually occur a few hours after eating a certain food and then it goes away. It can cause more gas and diarrhea and pains, um, but it shouldn't cause more bleedings or fevers. 
And with increased fiber comes increased stooling and larger volume stools, so look out for that. Um, the inflammatory response is much more insidious or slow moving, and you'll recognize it in, um, in your IBD symptoms, such as fevers or blood in the stools or ongoing pains that just continue over time and don't improve. Um, and your labs and calprotectin do not normalize over time. And that would mean uh, treatment failure or this inflammatory response. So if you're on the diet and you're much, much better, but not completely well, then we kind of reevaluate the diet and see what in it can we remove or add to help with that inflammatory response. And so we incorporate some of the anti-inflammatory um, foods um, into the SCD as we move forward with the diet. Um, please note that you may have a slight weight loss initially, um, but uh, know that maintaining weight and go gaining weight over time is one sign of success on the diet. So we monitor weight pretty carefully. Um, and then, of course, monotony and burnout can be a problem. There is a high attrition with dietary therapy, no matter how well it works. And so just make sure at the beginning, especially keep snacks and snack ideas around, write a list of snack foods in the refrigerator for when you're hungry, but you don't know what to eat. You can peruse that list and kind of get ideas um, right then and there. Also, um, spend some time perusing the aisles in the supermarket, reading labels, kind of really familiarizing yourself with what prepackaged foods um, are available. And of course, try new recipes every month. Um, try new recipes. People tend to find a recipe, really like it, use it over and over again for months and months, and then get really bored with it and burnt out. And then that food is off the list. So try to prevent that from happening by um, exchanging the recipes over time. Um, in terms of determining response to the SED, um, response criteria is the same on the diet as with medications. So if you respond, it should be the same. Resolution of clinical symptoms, of course. Um, some people, again, because you're kind of treating small bowel bacterial overgrowth in some cases when you eliminate lactose and gluten. And so um, sometimes you feel a lot better clinically, but your labs don't respond. So just be cognizant of that. So you should have clinical response for sure. If you do respond, you should have improvement and eventual normalization of labs that usually follows um, improvement in clinical response. Um, and uh, that means that if you had mineral or vitamin deficiencies, they should be corrected over time. If you had anemia, that should normalize over time. Inflammatory markers such as ESR and CRP should um, improve over time or normalize. And if you started out having low blood protein, that should normalize too as your gut heals. Again, weight gain or maintenance and eventual linear growth is very possible and expected. And then mucosal healing is possible in the few patients that we have um, done surveillance scoping on. You can have mucosal healing as a result of the diet. We allow one to three months. Clinical change may be immediate, meaning within one to two weeks. Laboratory mucosal changes come later, and we do repeat calprotectin and monitor calprotectin every six to eight weeks while you're on the diet. And once we establish a really good um, uh, maintenance score, then we check every six months while you're on the diet. Um, and then concurrent therapy and interpreting responses, I think I went through that already earlier. In terms of um, figuring out what to do after you figure out response. So if you have a complete response, um, so after six months, all the labs are normal, you're feeling great, you're growing, then you continue the diet as strictly as for as long as possible, minimum six months, optimally 12 months, but even more optimally for me, every um, two to three years before liberalization. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, on the, on the diet, we, um, I said we monitor calprotectin um, every six months or so, but um, initially it's every six to eight weeks, two to three months, um, depending on when, when we can get the kids to collect it um, to monitor response. And then of course we adjust medications if appropriate. Some people do withdraw medications, but I usually reserve that for like after a year on the diet and I'm making sure, really, really sure that it's the diet and not the medicine. If, if the goal, if your goal as a family is to um, withdraw medications over time, then that should be made clear and the risk and benefits should be um, discussed very carefully um, and also 
there should be a methodical method for withdrawing medications, meaning very slowly. If there is partial response, then you can continue the diet therapy, but add another therapy. And then if there's no response or negative effects, meaning that the child is mentally just not happy, they're having more psychiatric or psychologic effects, such as depression or so much stress is causing them more flares than if they weren't on the diet, um, then of course, you would want to stop the SED or, and liberalize to um, a regular healthy IBD diet um, and escalate therapy. Now, we're, um, um, this is my second to last slide. I'm going to talk about liberalization of the SED. This is um, response dependent and highly individualized. I would not start liberalization until the child is in a stable state, meaning in remission and maintains remission. Um, if you can wait at least 12 months, that would be awesome. If you can wait two or three years, it would be even more awesome. awesome. The longer you can stay strict and the better um, mucosal healing you have, the more um, uh, success you'll have when you liberalize, meaning when you liberalize, you won't, um, you'll have less chance of going into flare. Uh, there are many potential paths to liberalization. Sometimes the cook is the one who needs the break because it's not easy to avoid mixed spices and you know to have to cook all the time and avoid eating out. So some people choose when they liberalize to actually um, use certain mixed spices where they're not really sure there's a little, there's some um, decaking de agents or maybe they choose to use it despite the decaking agent. Um, and as long as it's used in small amounts, it's okay. Um, some people liberalize by eating out more often um, and not having to kind of like tell the chef every individual ingredient. Um, and it's okay to have a little bit of um, cheddar cheese that's not uh, grated freshly, for example. Um, some people liberalize by eating a favorite meal that has every illegal ingredient known to man. Like my husband, once um, a month, he would eat two slices of pizza for one meal and that's his off meal. And over the past 15 years, he's getting to the point where he can have two slices of pizza um, once a week and tolerate it okay. And as you know, pizza has lactose, it has gluten, it has, you know, a sugar, it has everything that's not legal on the SED, but that's how he's choosing to liberalize and it seems to work just fine. Um, it does tend to be a slippery slope. Just know that if you do go into a, a slippery slope and you eat pizza instead of just once every two weeks or once every month, um, you do well. So then you start doing it once a week, then once every three days, the more almost um, the more ingredients or the more volume of starches that you introduce, the more likely you'll go into a flare. Um, and then you'll go strict again, and then and then you might liberalize again and, and kind of go back and forth from flaring and getting into remission. I found that there's really only a, like three to five lives. So if you kind of go strict and modify and go strict and modify and flare every time you modify, you really only have like three or four chances before something happens in your body where you don't respond um, quite as effectively, even when you go strict after you've done that too many times. Um, again, met being methodical and step-by-step -step about it is really important. Um, avoiding a slippery slope, checking the cereal Cal protecting every six to eight weeks as you introduce a new food or um, uh, new spices or kind of a, just a new way you're doing your SCD. You want to check the Cal protectin um, quite, quite frequently because sometimes you can see um, a rise in it uh, over time before you actually have clinical symptoms or an effect on your blood work. Uh, lab should be done per routine based on symptoms. I usually do labs every six months for somebody who's stable on the SCD. Um, and if, if they're perfectly fine, sometimes I do a year because I don't have to monitor for um, side effects um, of medications. Um, I said, oh, there appears to be a finite number of chances to correct the course, which I just spoke about. And then of course, if you cannot maintain the SCD for whatever reason, then aim for a modified SCD or a general healthy diet for IBD. Um, which is outlined here. Um, and this was published in um, 
April of 2020 by Dr. Levine and his group saying that people with Crohn's disease should eat lots of fruits and vegetables, avoid saturated or trans fats, emulsifiers, carrageenan or thickeners, artificial sweeteners, and other preservatives. People with ulcerative colitis should eat more omega-3 um, fatty acids from fish and in foods and avoid red meats, processed meats, of course, um, emulsifiers uh, and, and other artificial sweeteners and preservatives. So um, focus on a whole food diet. Um, so I hope this has been helpful to you all. I will be available for questions. And if you have any questions at all, please contact us in our IBD center at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Have a great day.